Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Let's stand and open our hymn books to hymn number 484. Yes, ma'am. Higher ground. 484. 484. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as my homeward ground, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground, Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven. But the question comes to me as I think of God. 
It's a hymn number 482, real close by, All to Thee. And I think this will be a new one too, also. I have heard the voice of Jesus calling clearly, follow me. No could ever promise life eternal and so free. All to Thee I give my all to Thee. All to Thee Thine only will I be. All to Thee O Christ of We had 137 this morning. We're about 50 off our what we were before the COVID, but we're getting there. And that's a praise. I'm going to tell you. I was tickled when I saw those of you that get to see the second service. I had me a Pentecostal fit as I was, I was excited over the folks that were here and how many were here it was great to see everybody and it's good to see you tonight all right I think I'm fixed up now we are always moving things and changing things and trying to get a better picture and all that I tell you the problem isn't with the picture the problem is with the Don't subject of the picture <laughs> uh, that's it I need to be a little shorter okay good well, let's take our Bibles out and go to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17. And we're going to cover that whole chapter. It's a great, two, kind of two stories that we're going to deal with and really good stuff. Really good stuff. The children of Israel, well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get off, all right? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We pray, Father, now that you'll bless our time together in your word. 
Father, guide us into some things maybe we've never seen or thought of. Let us, Father, leave here glad that we were in the house of the Lord tonight. Watch over those of us, Father, that are still not here. Bless them, Father. Keep them safe and bring them back to us soon. We love you and thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus 17. Let me just give just a little bit of setup. We are at the place of the Exodus, which is the children of Israel have been delivered from Egypt. They've come from Ramesses down and crossed the Red Sea under God's direction uh, through the Red Sea. The Egyptian army has been destroyed. They step out on the other side and they begin with such a great spirit about them. They've seen a miracle of God walk through the walls of water to the other side. And as soon as they get to the other side, what do they want to do? I mean, do they want to party or what? No, they want to complain. And complain they do. And it doesn't stop. It continues. They they have uh, water problems, and as we've described, the amount of water they need, it's a serious situation. But uh, God provides the water at Marah, the water of bitterness, the trees thrown in, and so there's the work done. Then uh, they come down and they spend some time at Elam, which is a place of the, the uh, 70, I think it's 70 palms, and the different pools of water, so they're okay there. However, they're running short on food, and so God provides then, as they move a little further, that he provides manna and quail. And they're seeing God provide. And God just continues to walk before them in the cloud by day and the fire by night. And God is awesome in his presence to them. So we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Let's just pick that verse apart for just a second. They've not lost anybody. All the congregation is still together. The children of Israel are still gathered together, walking together, about a mile and a half wide, about 60 miles in length. And so we're looking at a large group of people. And as they move, and then when they stop and camp, of course, they spread out and set up camp and they may be there for a day or two or as long as God till God begins to move again when they see the cloud or the fire move they immediately get up and they start packing and they start following it and notice it said they journeyed for the wilderness of sin uh, sin is actually a place it's not <laughs> you might think boy they need to get out of that place that's a sin place but uh, it's actually a place and uh, but they and it said after their journeys and when I saw that I thought what 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 journeys have they been on? Well, you know what he's doing? He's describing the different situations they've come through. They came from Ramesses to the Red Sea where the Egyptians came upon them. That was a journey. Then they traveled across the Red Sea and into uh, the peninsula of, uh, of um, Sinai. And now they're in the wilderness and they come to these different places. Uh, they come to Marah, where the water is changed and made sweet. They come to Elam, where the wells of water are. Then they come to the place of giving the manna in the wilderness of sin. And so the, each one of those, they move and then this happens. They move and then this happens. So when he says after their journeys, that's what he's referring to. Just the short little jaunts that they've had so far. So they finally come to this place called Rephidim. And it's a place where there is no water for the people to drink. That is a very serious problem. You can do without a lot of things, but you can't do without water. And we've described that before. And they certainly had a problem before them. And, and you can imagine the situation is dire. They need water. What are we going to do for water? Now, I'm not sure they've run out yet. But they're looking at their source of water, and there is none. And they realize that it won't be long till they're going to be in need of water. And so they're wondering, what are we supposed to do for water? We need water. Water, cool, clear water. <laughs> you see, isn't it great you come to Riverside Baptist? You get entertained as well as get to learn the Word of God. I mean, I don't know how you can beat that. So here we are. The people are needing water. And so what happens? Verse 2, what do you, what do you, wait, what do you think they're going to do? Oh, surely they're going to 
they're going to they're gonna praise the Lord for the fact of no water and, no, and just wait to see how God's going to provide. Uh, they, they've got to do that, don't they? I mean, they're God's children. God has sent Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. They've seen the waters parted on the Red Sea. They've walked and seen God before them with a cloud by day and a fire by night. They're not where they're not supposed to be. They're exactly where God has placed them. Surely in their hearts they're going, wow, this is going to be exciting to see how God provides this water. Amen. That's going to be... No. Verse 2. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses. Chide. I think the word just almost describes what's, you know, just chide with him. Just come up against him, talked bad to him, and said, give us water that we may drink. I don't know about you, when somebody comes to me and wants something, and it's not with a, the please or could you, instead it's give me you know, I'm tending to say, you know what, go find it yourself. Amen? I'm, I'm just kind of that way. I mean, I, I think we ought to be gracious and kind. And they should have approached Moses as just doing what God's called him to do. And, uh, and this is where God has led them. So don't lose that very serious, I mean, that, uh, don't lose that statement that we saw in verse 1, according to the command of the Lord. They have journeyed according to the commandment of the Lord. They are exactly where God wants them to be. The fire by night, the cloud by day. He, they, are, they can look and see the presence of God. My goodness, how awesome is that? To know I'm standing here, standing in Rephidim, where God has brought me, and there's the cloud. I'm looking at it. That's God's presence. And that should, in some way, give me some kind of peace that... It's going to be okay. God's going to take care of me. God brought me here. He didn't bring me here to die. He's, he said he's delivering me. God's shown himself faithful. Why in the world would I be so ungrateful? But you see, this is the entitlement part of slave mentality. They have been taken care of by Egypt. Egypt always took care of their needs. And so if they didn't have something, they'd go and say, hey, look, I'm out of this. What do you want to do about it? And Egypt, of course, take care of them because they were slaves. They want to make sure they were taken care of because they were slaves. And so they were taken care of. Now Moses is taking on the responsibility of leading them. And so they just assume, you know, Moses ought to take care of us. And if we don't see the water that's going to take care of us, we need to go talk to Moses and find out what his plan is. I don't want to wake up tomorrow without water. So I'm going to go talk to Moses. So you go talk to Moses with a slave mentality. You walk in and say, Moses, we're out of water. What are you going to do about it? Go get me some water, Moses. I, Moses is, is a patient man. But I tell you that I think even this kind of sets him off. What does he say to them? Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? I think, in essence, he said, I'm not your God. I'm not your God. I have no power to provide water for you. I have no power to give you bread or meat. But God does. Why are you talking to me? Why are you upset with me? Why are you chiding with me? And then he asked a very important question. Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Now remember, the wherefore ties that together. Why are you chiding with me? It's because you are doing this because you realize that by you doing this, you're doing this to the Lord. You're tempting the Lord. You're asking, and here's, listen, you think about, what is it that they're tempting the God about? What is it that they're trying him? What is it that they're wanting? Well, first of all, they want to know if his presence is real. We see the cloud. We see the fire. But we want to know there's no water. Where is he? What's he going to do about it? Now, they're not saying that. But that's what's going on in their heart. They say, they're also wondering, does he have power to do this? We don't have water. What is he going to do? Do you think he has power to provide us? We've seen him do it before, but is he going to do it again? We just need to know. They tried his patience with them. I tell you what, I'm already fed up with them. I mean, if I'm God, I'm fed up with them. I'm going, you know, I should have left you in Egypt, you sorry bunch. I ought to just split the Red Sea and let you walk out there and I'll treat you like I did the Egyptians. That's what he said. You know, if I'm God, probably that's what I would have done. You know, they're ungrateful. They are, they're intolerant. They're, 
expectant. They're entitled. They are a bunch of spoil. Even though they're slaves, they're small. They're small to somebody always hand feed them, taking care of them. God wants them to learn to, to, to be free man. It showed distrust in his power, in his providence, in his goodness, and his faithfulness. By their question to Moses, this is the things that they're actually saying about God. And then to demonstrate this ingratitude and rebellion, demanding that he work a miracle for them. There's a lot of people in the world today that are like this. There's a lot of Christians that are like this. You know, we have people call and say, I can't pay my electric bill. What are you going to do about it? Hello? I, I don't know. Is that my responsibility? I didn't know that was my responsibility. When did that become my responsibility? I don't know. You know, well, you're a church, aren't you? I've, I have actually, I've had, there was a time, it seemed like every week we'd have two or three people show up. And, and grown men, now that's the ones that irritate me the most, grown men. And I had a man come in my office one time and he said, man, I, I need some help. He said, could you help me with some, some money? I need, to, I need to get some groceries or something. I said, you know, let me ask you a question. D- did you, are you walking? Yes. D- did you walk past these stores up here? Well, yeah. I said, do you know those men that run those stores? You know they make more money than I do. And yet you have to come all the way down here to the church to ask for something. And you never ask them one time for anything. How come that is? I mean, I'm just a poor little old preacher. You know, I, I, I just, I, I, all I have to give you is what I make. And I don't make what they make, I can guarantee you. Why didn't you ask them? Well, because you're a Christian. Uh-huh. Yeah. You tempting the Lord your God what you're doing because you're saying God ought to do that. God does sometimes. But this is their problem. They, they, they think that they, 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 they are, um, they're deserving of this. God brought us out here. God's got to take care of us. Well, God's wanting them to grow up. Amen. Amen. You tempt the Lord. Verse 3, and the people thirsted there for water. I think that's interesting. After all of this complaining and going and griping, they just thirst for water. They're standing around, looking around. Where's the water? What are we going to do? And what happens? The people begin to murmur against Moses. Of course. Why not? Let's murmur against our leader. He brought us here. Wait a minute. Did he bring us here or did the cloud bring us here? Did he bring us here? That fire, that pillar of fire. Did he, is it Moses' fault we're here or is it God's? You know, this goes along with the message this morning. You realize that, don't you? You see, nothing happens in your life that God's not involved with. And you can be sure that whatever God brings in your life, he wants to use. It's amazing. So let me ask you a question. These people, they thirsted for water. They murmured against Moses. They said, wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Oh, my goodness, the same old argument. He brought us up. See my poor little baby right here. Here's my child. You're going to let that baby thirst to death? What are you going to do about this? This is your responsibility. Come on. It's the same, same, same song, second verse, third verse. And we've just gotten started. We haven't even made it to Sinai yet. We haven't even made it to the giving of the law. We haven't even got close to the promised land. And these guys are just complaining like crazy. Let me ask you a question. As the people of God, what should they have done? Give me some things you think they should have done. Pray. Do what? Dig a well. I don't find any of them saying anything about trying to dig a well. Thank God for what he had done. Let me list some things. Trust God. Amen. When you don't know what else to do, trust God. You know why? Because he can be trusted. Amen. When nothing else is going right, you can find, you can trust God in that situation. Trust him. And then encourage. Why not be an encourager in those times? Instead of being a complainer, why not be an encourager? Encourage people. Hey, I'm, I, I haven't got much, but I'll share with what I've got. We'll be all right. God didn't bring us up here to die. Be an encourager. Find some way to encourage the people around you. And then train your children about faith. 
What a great opportunity to teach their children about faith in a God who will be faithful. I think that's the greater thing to teach there. Faith. And then pray. Talk to God. Go to him first. Before you jump in the mob train, you know, get off into the chapel for a little while and spend some time with God. They should have gone to God first. Well, what does Moses do? Verse 4 says, And Moses cried unto the Lord. Well, see, that's what they should have been doing. They're up there chiding with Moses, and they should have been crying to God, saying, What shall I do unto this people? Moses said, They be almost ready to stone me. I'm reminded of the times when I will many times leave here and head to the house, and I will say to the Lord, Lord, those are your sheep. <laughs> Lord, you need to take care of that. This is, a, this is yours. And that's almost what Moses is saying. He says, he's, he's, he tells him, he says, Why should I, what should I do with this people? Well, who are these people? They're God's people. Well, who shall I do with these people? And then, of course, he was fearful. They are ready to stone him. This was serious. So he's concerned for his life as well as concerned for his leadership. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people. And take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. So God gives him some commands. Go on before the people. Mm. Lord, uh, Moses, Lord, I, you were listening to that part of the prayer I just offered, didn't you? Did, did you hear that part about they're ready to stone me? And you're wanting me to go to the people? The Lord said, yeah, in fact, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down there and get their leaders together. Lord, if the people are ready to stone me, I can tell you they're being led by a bunch of leaders, and you want me to go get those who are wanting to stone me, their leaders? Yeah, go get them. And then what? Then I want you to take your rod, the rod that I gave you, the rod that I've let you use to demonstrate my power in your hand. Take that rod. Okay. I can beat them off with it. <laughs> See, the people had seen what Moses could do with this rod, the rod of God. Wherewith thou smotest the river, take it in your hand. This is man's, God's tool in man's hand, how God couples the two together. You know, that's the way God does his work. It's interesting, we always, and we say this a lot, you know, God can do this work without us, but he doesn't. Do you realize that? God could, but he doesn't. God uses us. Now, you like me, you have to ask the question, why in the world does he do that? You know, why? He could get angels to do what we do. He could get, he get somebody to be a completely obedient to him to do that. Why would he choose me? Why would he ask me to be a part of what he's doing? Because that's the way God works. And that's what he's doing here. Now, God could take care of this problem. I mean, God could bring rain. God could have just said, don't worry, Moses, I got it. And he could have provided it in some way. But God says, I need you. I want you as a man. I want you as a person. I want you to be my in-between. I want people to see. I want them to see you doing my work with the tools I give you. And so that's why he tells him, put it in thy hand and go. And then he gives him a promise, verse 6. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. So he gives him a promise. I, God, will stand before thee. Maybe it's the pillar of fire. Maybe it's the cloud. Whatever it is, but God's presence is going to be known right there, standing with Moses. That's important. When these people are coming to stone Moses, and all of a sudden they see God's presence with him, it establishes not only that God is in control, but also that God has placed his hand upon Moses as the leader for this people. And they need to listen to him, and they need to understand him, and they need to respect him because he's God's choice to be their leader. And so he's establishing the fact that he is the leader. And then he says, uh, Behold, I stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come out water out of it, and the people may drink. So understand this. He's telling Moses to go stand on the rock. It was a particular rock. It wasn't just a rock. It wasn't just part of the mountain. It was a particular rock that God had chosen for him to stand on. And that rock he was to take and he was to use the rod that God had given him and he was to hit the rock 
And then God said water would come out. Now, I'm Moses. I'm, again, I'm going, okay, I'm going to go down here and call the people together who want to kill me. I'll get their leaders who also are leading them to kill me. And I will take this rod, which is made of wood, and I'll go down there and stand on the rock, and I'll hit the rock with the piece of wood, and water's going to come out. In some way, this piece of wood is going to break that rock open. It's going to do something to make that rock obey. I, you know, all of that just requires tons of faith on Moses' part, doesn't it? For sure. But that's exactly what God's going to do. And the rock, understand this, what a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. The rock. Jesus is the rock. And we who have received our eternal life comes from him being smitten, beaten for us. And out of him comes the living water. Amen. And we have that. What a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. Well, Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, when it comes time, he goes to the rock. He stands on the rock. He makes sure that everybody can see, but especially these elders. Now, it's important that he made that point here. There's some reason for that. We don't have it given to us, but I've got to understand there's got to be a reason why God would include that Moses did this in the sight of the elders. He did it in the sight of all the people, didn't he? But especially the elders of Israel. Why? Because I think God wanted them to back him up. He wanted them to stand with him. They were to be a part of this in a sense. And they were also, the next time the mob gets together, they're to be the ones to stand up and say, hold it. Let's be careful about this mob mentality that wants to go against the leader God's placed over us. Remember what Moses did, how God gave him the ability to bring water from the rock. He wants them to be their witness. He wants them to stand with him. And so they needed to be close to see what was going on. Verse 7, And he, Moses, called the name of the place Masa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now then, a couple of things. The, the two words, Masa, means testing. Meribah means contending. And so he names this place to remind them of what they did here. They were questioning God. They were testing God. They were contending with God and what God wanted to do. And then he says, and, 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 be, and chiding with the children, is, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us? Now, as I read that, I can, see two th I can see one of two things here. And I think it would be either, but I think I understand what he's saying. He's saying, this is where they came and this is what they chided. Is the Lord among us or not? This is what they were complaining about. But wouldn't it be great if Moses standing on that rock gushing with water would have asked the question, is the Lord with us or not? Amen. Wouldn't that be cool? So I put down below, did Moses ask this question? Or was it a declaration about what they had asked? I like to think that maybe it was Moses who asked that question to put an exclamation point upon this particular mo, uh, activity that God did this. But either way, God is among them. Well, we move to the next story. We move to the next, we've moved past now. The water's been given. Things have been satisfied. Everything's going well. Between verse 7 and 8, everything has calmed down. And what happens? Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So here they've been given the water. God's provided the water. God miraculously provides the water through this rock. And now here comes Amalek to fight with Israel. Have we heard of Amalek in other places of Scripture? We have, haven't we? Have we heard of the Amalekites? That's this group of people. They were a nomadic band. They lived kind of all over the place. In fact, we find them here down in this lower part of the wilderness. We later are going to find them up near Israel. We're going to find them in Israel. We're going to find them fighting uh, with Israel. They are a nomadic tribe, descendants of Esau, and they will plague Israel until they're finally destroyed by Hezekiah way later on from this moment. But here they come to fight with Israel. Now, let's talk about that for a second. Israel are slaves. 
coming out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. Are they warriors? Are they soldiers? Have they been, have they been trained in the art of battle? No, of course not. Egypt wouldn't train them that way. They're slaves. Are they prepared for this fight? But this is the first fight for the nation of Israel right here. This is it we're about to read about. This is the battle for Israel. Now, let me just say something about Amalek too. Amalek, like I said, is going to be a problem for Israel for many, many, many years. They're not going to be defeated here. Uh, later on, we're going to read about them with Saul. Remember, God tells Saul to go to the Amalekites and to destroy them, to wipe them out, not even bring any spoil back. Leave it there. Kill it all. Men, women, children. I know it sounds terrible, but God said destroy them. God wanted them annihilated. And what did Saul do? He brings back the sheep and the goats. And Samuel meets him and said, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? What is that I hear? The bleeding of sheep and goats. Oh, well, we brought them back to sacrifice. Yeah, right. And who else did you bring? Oh, we brought King Agag back with us. Agag, the king of Amalekites that God said to annihilate. They bring back. Well, they kill him, but still they did not do what God said. And there are Amalekites that are left that they did not kill. Later we find them again. Um, with David. David fights the Amalekites. So there they are again, still, nemesis against Israel. They're a problem. In fact, you read the book of Esther, and guess who you're going to find is old Haman. Remember Haman? He comes against Esther and Mordecai. Do you know he's a descendant of Agag? Huh. There we are in Persia. We're way far from this, and who are they still fighting? These Amalekites. Agag was a, or a Haman was a, Haman was a, a descendant of Agag. It says in, I think, Esther 2, it says he was an Agathite. And uh, so he comes from a descendant of these Amalekites. A very much a problem to Israel when we read Esther. Well, so they come to fight. Verse 9, And Moses said to Joshua, Choose out men, go out, fight with, Am and with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with a rod of God in my hand. <coughs> now Joshua is an awesome fellow. But I'm going to tell you, Joshua was a slave just like the rest of them. He was not trained in battle. He was not a warrior. And yet God chooses him through Moses because Joshua is going to be the great general of Israel. He's going to be the replacement for Moses. This is, this is Joshua. And this is the first time he's mentioned. And here we have him now declared to be a warrior. Choose out man, a leader, a general. Choose out man, go out, fight with Amalek. We've never done this before, Moses. We don't have an army. We don't have any, we don't have any chariots. All the chariots of Israel, Egypt were destroyed. We don't have any, any kind of weapons of war. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to do that? Now, I don't hear Joshua asking that. Because when I read the book of Joshua, I find out Joshua was quite the guy. He had faith in God like nobody else had faith in God. And if Joshua was asked to do the job, he's going to do the job. So he chooses out man. Now, if I'm Joshua, I'm going out there and I'm looking for the guys that have the physique of a, of a warrior. I'm looking for a guy that can carry his weight, somebody I'd want to fight with me. And he goes out and he chooses the men. And once he does, they go out to fight against Amalek tomorrow. And what does Moses say? I'll go up and stand on the hill. Now, if I'm Joshua, I might say, I'll tell you what. You go choose the men and I'll go stand on the hill. <laughs> I'll do that. Let me, let me do that job. But he doesn't, of course. And this is all under the inspiration of God. God knows what he's doing. There's a reason for this. And so he goes to the top of the hill with the rod of God in his hand. God had given him that rod. It was, a, it was an evidence of God's power in the hand of Moses. And so verse 10 says, So Joshua did as Moses had said to him. That's a great general. Amen. A general takes orders from his next um, higher rank. Thank you. And uh, he does what he's asked to do. He doesn't have to question it. He does what he's asked to do. What a great general we see in Joshua. He did as Moses said. We don't have, there's no question. He just does it. This is done on the morrow. And fought with Amalek. 
And Moses, Aaron, and her went up to the top of the hill. This is a very familiar story. You should find this familiar. So Moses takes these two leaders with him, and they go to the top of the hill, and it came to pass. This means as, as things went on, they noticed something was happening. There was something that took place. When Moses would hold up his hand, Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So here they are, Moses, Aaron, and Hur. He's standing with the rod, and they're fighting the battle. And as they're fighting the battle, they notice uh, Aaron and Hur standing beside and say, do, do, do this, Moses, raise your hand up. And Moses raises his hand. And all of a sudden, man, Israel's doing like that. I mean, just tagging them. I mean, just going to town on them. And then Hur says, put your hand down. He puts his hand down. And all of a sudden, here comes Amalek and his armies, and they come against them, and they start pushing this way. Aaron says, let's try that again. Raise that hand up. And he raises his hand up. And sure enough, Israel wins. And Hur says, put your hand down. He puts his hand down. And they come back. Aaron and her say, Moses, keep your hand up. And so he holds his hand up, and he's holding it up. Now, you've been to praise services where they say, get your hands in the air, you know. And you keep them up, you keep them up, you keep them up. And about the time you're tired, they say, put your hands back in the air. And you put your hands up, you put your hands up, you put your hands up. And after a little bit, you go, you know what, I'm going to praise the Lord my hands down. Well, I'm going to tell you, Moses holding his hands up got tired. And Aaron and her saw what was happening, so they go and grab a rock. Let's see what it says. And it came to pass when Moses held his hands up, verse 12, I'm sorry, but Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat there on, and Aaron and her stayed up his hands, one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. They fought all day. And Moses had his hands in the air the whole time. Not because he could hold them up, but because Aaron and her were there to hold them up. They got a rock, said, here, sit here. He sits down, and they get on both sides. I mean, one holds this hand, one holds the other hand, and they hold his hands up. And as long as his hands are up, the battle prevails. They, they, the Israelites prevail in the battle. What a wonderful thing that is. Now, there's something there you need to see. They fought all day. When he holds his hands up, they're winning, but they're still fighting. Amen? That didn't make them win the battle. They still had to fight the battle. But it gave them the encouragement when they would see his hands raised. And God used it to bring Israel to that place where they would fight with all their might. And they would they would be defeating, thank you, they'd be defeating the Amalekites. What an amazing thing. And then the thought of Aaron and her. What a beautiful picture. You've seen this. I, I know every preacher has preached this. I don't think I have, but it needs to be preached. Aaron and her are the supporters of their preacher. These are the people that stand beside their preacher. These are those that stand and lift the hands of the preacher. They're, they're there to hold him up and encourage him and to give him what he needs so that he can do the job God's called him to do. And that's the, what Aaron and her are. They're a picture of those God provides in leadership to promote or to encourage those that are in leadership even above them. And we need that. You know what I see too? Look at this. Isn't this cool? You have the, the Israelites who are fighting. I believe we also have a whole group of them that are over here kind of watching and praying and ready to go in if they need to. We've got the women and the children. They're not fighting, I don't imagine. But it's the men. He chose out men. And they're the, they're the armies. And we see them. And then we have the general who's Joshua. And I'm sure he established some leaders under him. And so we have that. And then we have Aaron and Hur who are there with Moses. And then we have Moses with the rod of God. You know, I see God's hand in every position. Every part of that is important. If Moses had gone to the top of a hill and raised his hands, and Joshua and the army stood off to the side and just held their hands like this, you know who would have won the battle? Amalek. Moses had to do his job. Aaron and Hur had to do their job. Joshua had to do his job. And the soldiers had to do their job. The people of Israel had to do their job. You know what? That's the same way in the church. You got a leader that may lead. But he's, he, can't, he can't do anything if he doesn't have people to follow. Amen. Everybody has a position. Everybody has something that we need to be doing. And it's important that every job gets done. That's right. That's right. This, isn't, this isn't a church gym built, plus God. I hope not. If I do, it's in trouble. It's a church God built. And he put us in positions for the jobs that needed to be done. And we need to fill those positions and be faithful to them. Uh, verse 13. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Of course he did. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it. 
in the ears of Joshua. I, I found that kind of interesting. I understand writing a book of memorial, a historical book, a book of history for Israel that they could sit around and talk about. You remember that great war? Remember, here were the generals, and here was Joshua, and here was Aaron, and Ur, and he writes down all that, that took place that day. It's, it's a great thing. It's history, and you need history. You need to be able to see it. It reminds you of the victories. It reminds you of the defeats so that you'll know what to do. But here he says, this is a memorial to rehearse in the ears of Joshua. God is preparing Joshua for the position of leadership. And he doesn't want Joshua to ever forget how this battle was fought. And the importance of each person that, that played a role in the defeat of Amalek here. It's important that we have these books, these history books that are written. And then notice this, God says something very important. He says, for I will utterly put out a remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Here's the first time we hear of Amalek. And here God says, I'm going to annihilate them. I'm going to put them out. They will be put out of remembrance from under heaven. They'll be gone. They'll be annihilated. This is God's plan for Amalek and the Amalekites. And he will do that. Finally, with Hezekiah, who will defeat them for the last time. And they'll be no more. But until then, they're going to keep coming back. Back and forth. Just like little dogs. Just dipping at your feet and napping, at, napping around your, your, your feet and just causing problems all the time. Verse 15, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, which is the Lord is my banner. Here Moses was, he was standing on the hill, and as he raised that rod, it was an encouragement to people. Understand this, you know what Moses was? Moses was like the American flag in every battle. They look for the standard. And those flag bearers, they were some of the most courageous men that fought during the, the Civil War. They would carry that flag to, its, to, to their death. And then if they saw it laying on the ground, somebody else would pick it up and carry it. Because as long as they could see that flag, they knew there was a possibility they could win. There was something going on in their favor. And listen, that's what Moses says about here, that God is my banner. He's my standard. He's the one that I look to to be at the end of the battle, to provide the, uh, the victory that we need. It's the standard on which, under which we march into battle. Verse 16, for he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So they know there's coming battles with this group of people. It's not over yet. There's going to be, in fact, he says, from generation to generation. So we just will get ready for it. Do you know it's a great thing? If, you know, all the parts of the Exodus are symbolic of the Christian life. Crossing the Red Sea is symbolic of us being saved. The wilderness wandering is us as, as Christians growing in our faith, testing and trying to prove God and making sure that we have faith in what God can do. We come to the promised land and God says go in and sometimes we're not ready to go into the victorious Christian life and we fail. Other times we come to it and we, God says now go in and we go in and we possess that time of the victorious Christian life in the promised land. But let me give you a, a thought about Amalek. Amalek symbolizes the flesh. Think about it. He is, we're, it's somebody, it is something that we're going to war with all our lives. The flesh. From generation to generation it has happened. The flesh. And yet we are called upon by God to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Mortify, that means to kill, to annihilate the deeds of the flesh. God says put them out of your life. Be done with the sins of the flesh. Get them out. Kill them. That's what God said about the Amalekites. But just as Israel failed in their taking care of the Amalekites, we fail in taking care of the flesh. And so we battle it. And however, we always seem to come up short in the task of destroying the flesh until the flesh is finally destroyed by death. Then we win victory from it forever. That's why it says, and when death has come and the flesh is destroyed, oh, oh uh, grave, where is your victory? Oh, um, death, where is your sting? And it's gone at that point of death. We no longer battle the flesh once we're dead. Amen? Amen. 
when the old body's dead, can't do any more, we, it, it, we have won the battle over the flesh at that point. But we are to continually be battling the flesh. And so remember that when you're studying about the Amalekites. They are symbolic of the flesh. All right. Any question, comment, or thought? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a beautiful picture of especially baby Christians. How that baby Christians, they come and they complain against God and they just, and I say, say baby Christians because I think all of us do, but baby Christians, that's where they start and they're growing their faith. These are people that just came out of slavery. They've crossed over into the wilderness and now they're learning that God is going to provide, that God is going to be faithful. And they struggle with that. Because they've never had that before. They've never seen that before. And now all of a sudden they've got to trust that God is going to take care of them. And, uh, and, and, and they are contentious. And I love the fact you said we see his mercy. Where, where Moses says, what am I going to do with these people? God says, here's what we're going to do. Go get you, uh, go get you some men and y'all go down to the rock and stand there. And he doesn't, he doesn't get upset. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't say, I'm going to kill them. God patiently understands where they are in their walk of faith and they're not there yet and so he's got this whole weird 40 years of wilderness wanderings where he's hoping they're going to come to that kind of faith or he plans for them to all right any other question comment or thought good good comment anybody else all right then well we'll call that an evening then how about that and uh Remember that tonight you do not have to clean your pew or anything. Miss Fanny will take care for that for tomorrow. And uh, she wants you to leave that for her to do. So uh, you leave that and let her take care of that for you. And that's her way of honoring. Thank you for being here today. I hope it's been a blessing. Uh, are these stories wonderful? I just love going through them and seeing the things that are wrapped inside of them that many times we don't see them as we just read through them. And I think it's good for us. Well, let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you've done. We pray now, Father, you'll go with us uh, all this week. And, Father, that we'll be, we'll, be, we'll be faithful, not to criticize, not to murmur. But Lord, be encouraging, to be committed, to be decisive, to be loyal to you in everything. No matter what the circumstances we may have to go through, Lord, let us find peace in knowing that you are in control, that we can trust you. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful story tonight. And thank you for the wonderful people of this church. And bless us and go with us this week and give us a great week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.